Uh, so welcome everyone to the first event uh, as part of today's uh, program. So it's a pleasure to have Jörg Teschner from uh, University of Hamburg and Daisy. Uh, he will be uh, uh, giving a mini course and today is the first talk and the title of the mini course is Analytical Geometric Langlands Correspondence, Relations to Conformal Field Theory and Integrable Models. Jörg, the floor is yours. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh... You can hear me well, just to check one more time. Yes. Okay, very good. Yes, so uh, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. And uh, this really uh, uh, looks uh, like a, uh, well, exciting event. I mean, um, it made me return to a subject that I uh, had liked a lot, uh, sort of which I tried to uh, understand a little bit from well, the perspectives uh, I came from, which is, uh, well, conformal field theory, integrable models, and uh, also more recently, um, gauge theory, which is uh, the geometric lung lens correspondence. Um, and uh, yeah, so the plan is, uh, as was uh, basically announced on the website, to have uh, three lectures, one being sort of, I mean, they will proceed in a semi-historical fashion, uh, the first will be a review of the approach based on conformal field theory uh, to the geometric lung lens correspondence that was uh, pioneered by Bailinson and Greenfeld using importantly some results of Fagin and Frankel. Um, I will present it a little bit, say, well, in my own words and from my own perspective, but uh, yes, it is heavily based on the review uh, that, uh, especially the review that Evert Frankel wrote on this subject in 2005, I believe, um, it is on the website. Uh, the second part will be then uh, more recent developments, which basically, well, gives it a new twist, uh, analytic version. And then thirdly, um, there will be some, to a certain extent, well, some, some additional um, material, which is to a certain extent unpublished or some older uh, work on mine, which connects it to some other aspects of uh, say conformal field theory, um, as well as gauge theory. So that's roughly the plan. Um, and I should admit, I mean, well, by now sort of uh, what is called geometric lung lens, um, it has uh, developed uh, several branches. So um, it has an origin, um, um, say, in algebraic geometry in the works of Berlin and Greenfeld, and uh, has a whole school developed in mathematics, uh, developing this approach further, making it more precise, making it more general, etc. cetera. Um, this is not what I can review today. So especially, for example, Gates, Gurry, and collaborators uh, um, pushed it very far in this direction. Uh, but yes, there are other directions or branches it has developed um, which highlight other aspects of the story. And uh, in particular, yes, I would highlight, like to highlight one which is sort of uh, well closer to my expertise and interests, which has, uh, which combines algebraic aspects as uh, were the origins of the subject uh, with some analytic uh, aspects. Well, of course, geometric aspects are um, very important throughout. And I think the beauty ultimately is that um, uh, there should be a, well, uh, uh, profound and, and uh, very interesting interplay between these uh, three aspects. So in some respects, I think it also um, sort of these variants, which are now called analytic geometric lung lens following uh, eating off uh, Frankel and Kashtan, they sort of also bring the subject closer to its roots, which is the original lung lens program in the fear of automorphic forms. But okay, these are then again, further aspects, which I will not have the time to discuss. So let us focus on uh, conformal field theory uh, perspective uh, on the geometric lung lens program and uh, start. So to begin with, I want to very briefly and schematically um, give some first orientation on what the geometric lung lens correspondence is about. Um, this may still be quite obscure if you have not previously heard about this to 
um, some of you, but anyway, it is meant as a sort of first orientation. Some aspects uh, and some, say, definitions of the objects involved will become a little more concrete on the way. So the way it is often presented is uh, uh, as a correspondence between certain local systems on the Riemann surface C. So we're considering um, as an underlying, um, say, arena, a Riemann surface, uh, usually denoted C which um, for us will be assumed to be either compact or may have um, um, some finite number of punctures. Uh, I will not always be able sort of to discuss uh, sort of in details how, I mean, for example, punctures and so on are uh, realized in full detail, but this is sort of uh, the, well, the generality in which um, um, most of the following uh, um, discussions will work. Um, right, so that was about the ribbon surface. Then, yes, uh, it's a correspondence between, say, two classes of objects. So let's just give them names and then start explaining a little bit uh, what uh, is behind these names. So on the one hand, it's about local systems. On the other hand, it's about D modules on the moduli space of holomorphic vector bundles on that same ribbon surface. So to begin with, what are these local systems? For us, they will be pairs consisting of a holomorphic um, GL bundle. And I will uh, well, say a word about Lie group, Lie uh, algebra aspects in a moment, and a connection on that bundle. Um, and uh, yes, the key thing that makes it into our, which, well, is the origin of the name of this Langlands duality is that uh, the objects here on the left and on the right, here on the, in the top uh, boxed uh, uh, lines, are associated to two, um, in general, different Lie algebras. So there's a Lie algebra G of the, say, uh, complex reductive group G, which um, um, is defining the objects here on the right. And uh, then there is a Lie algebra G Langlands dual uh, whose um, Cartan matrix is obtained from the Cartan matrix of G by transposition. And th that is the Lie algebra underlying the definition of the objects on the left. And um, yeah, so we're talking here on the left about local systems, that is pairs of holomorphic G bundle with a connection. And uh, well, what are these uh, uh, so called D modules on bund G? Um, if you want, um, you can think of them as being certain differential equations um, and the more concrete incarnation that it will take uh, uh, in the following is either the differential equations that are uh, defined from um, a flat connection on that space, the space now being the moduli space of bundles. Um, and um, well, on the other hand, there will be certain eigenvalue equations uh, following from such um, uh, differential equations. Well, more generally, of course, there's a whole theory um, for D modules, basically, I mean, a D module is defined by a rule specifying how uh, differential operators get realized on certain vector spaces. So this we don't have the time to introduce. So uh, either you know uh, what D modules are or you're invited to uh, think of, to think about the more concrete incarnations uh, that this will take in the following and we will make it uh, more concrete on the way. So just for the sake of orientation, let me notice that, uh, good, we're basically here returning to the formulation um, at the origins, uh, uh, say, well, as were discussed um, or proposed by Balinson and Greenfeld. By now it has been made much stronger and uh, in some respects uh, more precise. Uh, so there are categorical versions of this uh, correspondence. And uh, by now the sort of ultimate version uh, is believed to be the one given by Arinkin and Geitzgeri. But uh, this is also not what we're gonna discuss here. What I would like to uh, um, mention though is that um, of course, in mathematics, there is a program towards the proof of these correspondences, which in well, full generality uh, should be better called conjectures uh, at this point. 
And there's a, a sketch of the proof uh, for uh, basically GLN, if I'm not mistaken, by Gatesbury. And uh, in the end of the day, uh, what is being done currently um, um, towards the proof of this still uses importantly these uh, results by Bellington and Greenfeld. So the, they provide a certain input, even though, uh, I mean, even if you, uh, you may be ultimately interested in these uh, stronger and more general conjectures of Arinkin and Geitzgeri, which uh, then replace here these objects, well, by categories um, of, I mean, categories of say these local systems or D modules and you have to say more precisely which categories you want to consider then. Uh, but as I said, this is not what we want to discuss uh, in these lectures. Anyway, there's a further restriction that uh, Berlin and Driefeld made uh, for the cases that they actually proved. Uh, namely, they considered special local systems here on the left hand side uh, of these uh, GL local systems, which are called oppers. And I shall make just, well, uh, as I'm not, I mean, for discussing sort of all this in, in highest generality, uh, this definitely requires building a certain machinery and a certain language, uh, which I cannot do in these lectures, it takes time. So my intention is just to give you sort of a very first orientation if you're not uh, familiar uh, with these things. And uh, well, as it often happens uh, to pick an example here, the example associated to the Lie algebra SL2 uh, is helpful for doing that. So in we will formulate a part of the statements um, say in a way that sort of straightforwardly generalizes but uh, some of even the statements I just want to formulate for the case of SL2 in order to save some well preparations uh, not not to have to introduce too much of notations and so yes this concerns in particular the notion of operas so uh, operas uh, for the case of SL2 can be quite concretely represented as uh, certain pairs um, of bundles E with a connection nubla, where the bundle is a very special one, namely the unique up to isomorphism extension um, of the um, square root of the canonical line bundle on our Riemann surface C. Uh, to the power minus one uh, uh, by, uh, well, the k to the plus one half. So this is uh, up to isomorphism, basically defining a unique type of bundle, a very special kind of bundle. If you want, um, you can just replace uh, this language of uh, extensions by uh, that we're defining it in terms of, uh, well, some um, cover of the Riemann surface uh, and transition functions of an upper triangular form where um, then these, uh, well, uh, you see here, the point is uh, uh, that basically, so this lambda ij would be the transition functions of this uh, uh, square root of canonical line bundle. And then uh, what turns on sort of an extension, what makes it uh, um, uh, not a direct sum line bundle is here um, something that is uh, well, obtained from the transition function uh, itself. So it is a basically canonical type of bundle that you can define. Uh, and that is what defines the so-called upper bundle. And yeah, most importantly, um, um, let us describe how the connections are allowed to look like. Well, they are locally gauge equivalent to a form like here where we have zeros on the diagonal in the connection one form and the one um, of the, I mean, below the diagonal. And then the only datum, the only locally varying datum that we have to define an upper connection is this uh, locally defined function T uh, of Z. So which is a function say in the local uh, charts defining a cover. And uh, if you change the local coordinates on the ribbon surface, um, um, like here, so you have a new coordinate, say, um, which you obtain from the coordinate z by a holomorphic function phi of z, then uh, uh, the relationship between the t of z and the t associated to the new coordinate uh, phi of z uh, is as uh, written here, where you um, see an inhomogeneous term, an interesting inhomogeneous term, 
which is called uh, the Schwarzschild derivative of phi. So phi, this uh, holomorphic mapping between coordinates. And this is known as uh, an important object which appears in many pieces of, uh, say, Riemann surface theory, is called a projective connection. So in essence, basically, projective uh, connections uh, define SL2 operas uh, and vice versa through this uh, correspondence. All right. Um, that is, uh, well, what should be emphasized, and that is a general feature that generalizes beyond the case of SL2, the uh, moduli space of oppers is a half dimensional uh, subspace in the space of all local systems on a Riemann surface. So the, lo the local systems themselves form a moduli space uh, and uh, the space of oppers are a half dimensional subspace thereof. Uh, in this case, sort of, it is relatively equal, easy to see. Well, you can make a dimension count. Uh, uh, you would have 6g minus 6 in the compact case of dimensions for the local systems. And uh, the t here, well, you can fix a reference projective connection, as we will do at some points on the way. And then the difference between t and the reference projective connection is a quadratic differential, because uh, this uh, inhomogeneous term would drop out. And so the space uh, is uh, the space of uh, projective connections is an affine space modeled uh, after the space of uh, quadratic differentials, therefore uh, 3G minus three dimensional. So, at, well, and now you have it, uh, it's half the dimension of the space of local systems uh, of SL2 local systems on the treatment surface. All right, so that may be uh, at some point becoming useful. Um, and uh, yeah, that's why I noted it. All right, so here's a remark that I already had formulated in words. And uh, yeah, so now we know, uh, uh, well, more concretely, which class of local systems we want to look at. Yes, what I wanted to emphasize is that uh, it's, even if we're basically connect, uh, restricting attention here to just half of the left-hand side of the geometric Langlands correspondence. Uh, it was pointed out or explained by Bellinson and Greenfeld that uh, the extension to generic local systems uh, is becoming possible by considering meromorphic operas. So here we assume the T's to be holomorphic. However, you can allow them to have a special type of singularities, which are called apparent singularities. And when you do that, in fact, um, well, there is a basically local gauge equivalence, uh, which uh, uh, will always hold between generic local system and these um, meromorphic operas with apparent singularities. So this just as a side remark, uh, I basically just want to stress that um, this restriction here to operas, in the end of the day, is not as, um, uh, as bad as it may look, um, uh, there is uh, a way sort of to then do in another step by allowing apparent singularities, the more general cases uh, in, a, in, a, in a somewhat similar way. I mean, quite similar way, in fact. Good. The approach to um, geometric Langlands uh, that was uh, pioneered by Bellin and Greenfeld uses ideas from conformal field theory and conformal field theory is a subject that uh, has an origin in physics and uh, here to introduce sort of the key ideas uh, or key definitions. Um, well, I want to make a start by basically offering a kind of dictionary uh, between sort of uh, physics jargon and math um, definitions. Uh, I will start on the side of physics, which in some sense, um, well, I, I, I would hope that um, you are at least roughly familiar with uh, some of the basic notions. I have to be very quick, but um, in any case, I want to mention the most uh, important notions here uh, briefly. And then try to, and then I will translate them basically into a bit more mathematical language, uh, thereby hoping uh, to be able to address uh, an audience which uh, consists of, say, um, well, colleagues from both uh, communities. So, um, anyway, so very roughly, um, um, the notions of conformal blocks as formulated in mathematics and physics. Well, they read as follows. So in mathematics, one speaks of spaces of um, 
co-invariants or invariants depends a little bit i mean there are somehow variants that are sometimes considered uh, of uh, vertex operator algebras voas like the verisoro algebra or for us here uh, the um, most important one throughout the affine lie algebra uh, this will be made uh, more precise on the next slide uh, a physicist rather thinks about functions uh, satisfying um, certain differential equations, which are called what identities, from which one can then build the full correlation functions uh, of a conformal field theory in the physicist sense. So, um, yeah, I, I want to start sort of uh, making this a little more concrete, but I cannot replace a full introduction to conformal field theory in these lectures, but uh, I hope at least to give some orientation if you have not heard of this uh, before, say from the physics perspective. And then, uh, as I said, uh, the math perspective comes next, which will be in principle precise definition. So we start, so the CFTs that will appear here, they are called Wesselman Witten models. We will start, but this is just for, uh, I mean, temporarily um, um, with the case of compact Wesselman Witten models that many of you may be familiar with associated to a group like SU2 say, although I should hasten to say that ultimately we have to go beyond that case really when we turn to uh, the geometric Langlands correspondence. So we will then basically just extract some uh, uh, algebraic uh, aspects of what in the compact case is being done in the physics literature. Um, so yeah, the key ingredients defining a Westman Witten model from the physicist perspective is a space of states which decomposes as a direct sum of uh, representations of two copies of an affine Lie algebra denoted G hat with uh, index K. Uh, and that is uh, just the central extension of the uh, loop algebra. So we're taking the tensor product of the Lie algebra SL2 with, um, well, the space of uh, Laurent series. And uh, the generators for these Lie algebra to introduce the notations, uh, they're often denoted JNA, um, so which I can say to use this uh, uh, concrete representation uh, as a tensor product of a generator uh, of the Lie algebra G, here SO2 TA, times, um, well, the basic uh, uh, Laurent modes Z to the N. And we're taking two copies of this fine algebra uh, in the full conformal field theory, where here we, um, well, uh, take the complex conjugate of this uh, mode function Zn. Okay, and uh, the way it is working is that we're going to have representations of the first copy, which has the generators J and A here on, R, on the representations Rm. I'm not gonna be terribly precise, so they're gonna be, so in this case, they would be uh, unitary highest weight representations, uh, irreducible highest weight representations. Um, and uh, here we have then representations uh, of what is algebraically basically the same, but uh, yes, we think of it as being corresponding to anti-holomorphic uh, 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 modes here. So that is uh, what is acting on these uh, second uh, uh, representations denoted Rn. That is the form of the space of states. And then we're uh, gonna have vertex operators, which by what is called the state operator correspondence are associated to, uh, I mean, a, a basis thereof is associated to vectors which have a tensor product form where we take um, a vector V from say this, uh, uh, representations uh, on which we act with holomorphic modes and the vector W bar in the representation on which we act with the anti-holomorphic modes. So the vertex operators are sort of key players. And then what we want is basically to compute in physics is uh, what is called the expectation values. Uh, so some functionals of the vertex operators, which one can, uh, well, make more precise sort of in the language of, um, um, VOAs. Um, yeah, so, but these expectation values then, they are uh, uh, meant to be functions, well, at least locally defined, or sections of suitable line bundles on that Riemann surface. That is basically the objects that define or that capture the physical content of the CFT um, in the 
physicist sense. And uh, what introduces then the uh, conformal blocks are, uh, well, the so-called holomorphically factorized representation of these expectation values or correlation functions. Uh, I can allow here uh, products of more than one such vertex operator uh, as an argument of this expectation value functional, but uh, I show, well, I didn't do that on this slide. And the point is then that they um, are expected or known or proven to have a form like here, where we have um, sums over products of something that is holomorphic times something that is anti-holomorphic. And uh, these objects, uh, well, reflect this uh, factorization here of the space of states. So for example, the vector V, which is a uh, element is uh, here, that is what is one of the um, arguments of this uh, conformal block function and the W bar, which is vector in RM bar is uh, in the anti-holomorphic part here. So that's the schematic form that these expectation value functionals then can take. And that shifts somehow the attention from these expectation values to their building blocks, which are called for conformal blocks in the physics literature. Holomorphic functions in particular of the uh, puts, I mean, the, the, the coordinate uh, which specifies the point at which this vertex operator is inserted. But also, it turns out uh, of the say moduli um, uh, of the Riemann surface here, which which specify the complex structure of the underlying Riemann surface. And there are some coefficients uh, which I don't want to talk about. Okay, so well, I'm a little slow, but that is sort of the uh, reminder or uh, lightning uh, um, review of conformal field theory from the physics perspective. Now we want to translate this into a more precise mathematical definition. We had introduced the fine Lie algebra, uh, the level K, I should have said, is, uh, um, well, the value uh, on which, I mean, the value by which the central element of this uh, fine algebra is represented on our representations, which we um, assume to be a fixed complex number in general, uh, in the case of these compact uh, SU2 with some Witten models, it would be a positive um, integer in fact. But uh, yeah, we are going to take the freedom to uh, play with the choice of the level and uh, in particular, a particular choice called critical level will then be important for the um, geometric Langlands application. Good, so I basically assume that you basically know what this is. Um, and we shall consider a quadruple of objects then where we take, okay, the underlying Riemann surface, a point on that Riemann surface. So we just mark a point on the Riemann surface. We uh, choose a coordinate around that point, uh, which we assume to be vanishing um, at P. So Z of P is zero. Um, otherwise, yeah. Um, and uh, furthermore, um, to that point, we will associate a representation of the affine Lie algebra. So these are the data that we will use in order to define a conformal block more precisely. So then uh, the more precise definition of a conformal block is to define it as a linear map from the representation, which is an infinite dimensional vector space to the complex numbers satisfying an invariance condition, which in particular knows about uh, the Riemann surface and the other data that we've specified. It takes the very simple form like here. So we have to define some operator on the representation, some um, linear map on this uh, vector space R, uh, which is defined, um, we call it, that's just notation, J of eta, and that is defined for all elements of G out, which are just functions, the algebra valued functions, which extend holomorphically away from that chosen point P over the Riemann surface. So that is the crucial condition. This defines a, well, a Lie algebra. And uh, well, then we do something perhaps a little funny at first sight. We're taking the Laurent expansion um, at the point P with respect to the chosen coordinate. And uh, each, whenever we see something like z to the k, eta times k with uh, eta k being a Lie algebra element um, in the Laurent expansion of eta, 
then we replace it by the operators representing eta sub k times uh, z to the k. There is an unfortunate choice of uh, notation here. The k here, ooh, this is bad, I should repair it maybe <laughs> later. Uh, uh, so the k here is the mode number. It is not to be confused with the k here, which is the level. Sorry about that. That was a, a bad um, choice of notation. So I should rename the k here into say n or r or something. All right, I hope uh, this being said, it doesn't lead to confusion. Um, in any case, so yeah, we now have an operator. So we take the Laurent expansion, replace sort of all these uh, modes which appear in it by some operator on R. So we're getting some operator J of eta, which acts on our representation space. And we require that the F is on that action on the, um, on the representation space, it is invariant. So it is basically the invariance under this, the such defined action um, of the uh, Lie algebra G out that we require as the defining condition for the, a conformal block. Okay, so this defines an element in the dual of that representation. And uh, well, there's a whole um, vector space of uh, solutions to this condition. That's a set of linear uh, equations in essence uh, on the dual of R. And so this defines a vector space. The space of solutions to this condition is, is called the space of conformal blocks. And what we can do is we can just pick a vector V in the representation R and then evaluate here our um, linear map on that vector. Well, that defines something that of course still remembers uh, the other choices in particular, the Riemann surface, the choice of the point and so on. So it defines a function of, uh, of these variables and uh, yeah, the dictionary in the end of the day turns out to be that uh, the function defined like such can be identified maybe upon choosing suitable normalizations with the function that here uh, uh, is, uh, uh, that here was called the conformal block in the physicist sense. So um, we will see that basically due to um, algebraic reasons, which have to do with a, uh, um, well, the, the algebraic origin, um, there will be differential equations that these objects have to satisfy. And uh, these are the differential equations then that uh, say physicists solve in order to compute these functions and rebuild um, the correlation functions uh, using an ansatz of this form. So that is roughly sort of how it works and how the relation between these uh, perspectives uh, in physics and mathematics goes. So in some sense, yeah, uh, if you want, you can refer to this dictionary uh, to translate it into the preferred language whatever. Um, there's a question, what is the label R? Uh, the label R here uh, in the notation, well, good. So um, here we are summing over a certain set of um, uh, solutions to what we call the word identities. And uh, what this here establishes is, so what I should have done is, Right, I'm, I'm, I have been a little imprecise here. So F is just an element uh, in the dual, in the, in, the, in the space of linear maps from the representation to the, to the complex numbers. I could have just chosen a basis, um, at least in good cases, I can choose a basis for the space of conformal blocks in this sense, label them by some index R, and then I just sh should have specified an index R here on the right hand side as well in order to label the elements for a basis in the space of all solutions to these conditions. Okay. So that is the, yeah, there should have been a label R here and uh, good. All right. Um, that's not sort of the most convenient way to deal with the conformal blocks ultimately. Um, and uh, there is something that is, uh, well, that has first appeared. Um, well, there's another um, intuition for the environs condition. Mm, well, it's a little hard to do this very quickly, but okay, on the one hand, it is basically 
Well, there's going to be a restatement uh, that is probably more intuitive and more familiar to physicists that will come up a little later. Namely, what this will be equivalent to is basically uh, the fact that, well, you can define from this guy here, this map F, what is called the expectation value of the current on that ribbon surface. And this condition here is going to be equivalent to the holomorphicity of that current. And that is sort of a formulation that is often uh, used in the physics literature. So that is a way to, so it is basically, well, uh, uh, when you integrate the current, then um, again, something here from this uh, space J out, uh, you get zero because you can, uh, you can, thanks to the holomorphicity of the current expectation, well, you uh, uh, pull the contour off the back of the Riemann surface and uh, then get the vanishing using residue theorem. But maybe a little quick, uh, maybe after the lecture, you can ask me again if this wasn't uh, satisfactory for you. Good, twisted conformal blocks. So we want to modify this definition in such a way that we uh, get additional parameters allowing us to write the defining invariance condition in the form of basically explicit differential equations on a space of exterior parameters, which will have the beautiful geometric uh, meaning uh, of the moduli space of holomorphic bundles on, th on the Riemann surface. So what do we do? We take this data that we had before, and uh, now, um, well, we take a local uh, chart UZ on which we have coordinates and so on. Uh, we can take out the point, then we get something which is uh, topological and angulus, and we can fix a holomorphic map from this angulus into the group G. So that is uh, defining what is called an element of the loop group. And uh, yeah, what we can then do is we can start with, say, a trivial bundle uh, uh, on that Riemann surface C, but we modify it by taking basically a two chart cover with U0 being obtained by just removing the point P from the Riemann surface. And then, well, when we take uh, uh, the coordinate chart uh, uh, around the point P as another set, then the combination, of course, will cover the ribbon surface. And uh, there is one transition function that uh, we can uh, look at, and we choose it at will. Uh, so that is a function from this uh, annulus to G. So what this defines are holomorphic G bundles, just very explicitly by cover and transition function. Uh, what is non-trivial result is that when G is semi-simple, then all G bundles can be represented in this way. So it suffices sort of to modify the bundle away from the trivial bundle at a single point P. And what you can, um, with just a little bit of thinking, deduce from that is a description of the moduli space of such uh, bundles um, as a double quotient, where you, uh, on the one hand, take here the uh, um, the loop group that is uh, the well here I okay that is a small change of notation that I meant to write here. So this year was meant to be identified with a, just the space of holomorphic maps from that annulus to the group G. Um, then of course, yeah, there are variants thereof that one can consider that would be denoted more precisely by the notation chosen here. But that is not so crucial for what I want to say. And then you can take the, can take out uh, by say right multiplication, uh, the maps, the holomorphic map, uh, the, the, the maps that are holomorphic uh, also at the point P, that is what is, uh, this guy here on the right, and you can take out the guys which extend holomorphically to the rest of the Riemann surface. So these are the maps from basically uh, here our chart U0 to the group G. That is what we take out here. And the statement, which is a mathematical theorem, is uh, that in this way we can represent um, uh, by doing the identifications um, um, with the elements uh, by left multiplication of G out or right multiplication of uh, G of T, 
uh, that is what um, um, that is what can be taken to represent the moduli space of G bundles on the ribbon surface C. Um, all right, so good. What we can then do is simply to twist the definition of the conformal blocks to by basically twisting these uh, the algebra valued functions G out by the elements well, that we get just by twisting uh, uh, the, 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 the algebra valued functions by conjugation with these uh, transition functions uh, uh, that, um, that are defined on the annulus. All right, so this is then, um, um, well, what replaces here in the definition uh, the Lie algebra G out. And then we can, however, just copy the definition um, um, we made up here, replacing the G out by the twisted, by the, by the thing that is twisted by the choice of a, of a G bundle. Good, there is an infinitesimal version thereof. Um, and um, um, there is an infinitesimal version thereof where we, represent the tangent space of the moduli of G bundles as, uh, well, the Lie algebra, I mean, the, 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 the double quotient of the Lie algebra elements on the annulus, um, modulo the holomorphic ones, and modulo, um, well, the elements G epsilon out. So that is uh, basically modulo the G I mean, the Lie algebra valued functions that extend holomorphically away from that point. Uh, what this allows us to do is um, it allows us to define a map from um, the space of Laurent series, Lie algebra valued Laurent series to tangent vectors on the moduli space of bundles. And using this map, we can define in order to basically complete our definition of the conformal blocks or to define more precisely a connection on the spaces of conformal blocks as follows. So we're declaring here that an infinitesimal variation of a conformal block, which was uh, defined using um, a twisting bundle uh, denoted E, uh, an infinitesimal variation of that conformal block in the direction zeta, um, which is a tangent vector, is represented by finding a um, Laurent series eta, um, which represents it in the sense of this double quotient. And uh, yeah, and then acting with it here in the argument um, of the conformal block. So it's in some sense the dual action of this J of eta, but now the eta is not uh, um, coming from here. So this is, uh, should not be confused. The eta is not an element uh, in G out here, but rather it is just any uh, Laurent series which represents the chosen tangent vector, vector uh, psi uh, thanks to this uh, isomorphism between the tangent space of the moduli of bundles and this double quotient. So this is what we insert here into the argument in order to define um, the action, um, well, of an, I mean, to define an infinitesimal, infinitesimal deformation of the conformal blocks. All right, so, Good. Uh, here, of course, there are choices involved, and uh, this is something that I, that I have to be somewhat brief about. Namely, um, I have to choose basically a representative in that double quotient uh, of a tangent vector psi. And well, of course, this involves some arbitrariness, but uh, in the end of the day, one can, with a little bit more of discussion, um, uh, um, understand that this arbitrariness is inessential, namely the statement I can make, and that requires a little more discussion uh, uh, to prove it, is that the representatives eta, so the Laurent series representing uh, tangent vectors psi, they can be chosen in such a way that the variations delta 
xi that are defined in this way preserve the defining invariance property. So they um, um, they map basically a conformal. So uh, you can think of this as being a mapping defining a infinitesimal variation of the bundle. Namely, um, it, def it maps a solution to the defining environs conditions, which were the ones here, which we started from, associated to bundle epsilon to the one, to a solution of the defining environs condition um, on a nearby bundle, which is uh, uh, obtained by shifting the bundle in the direction psi by some infinitesimal amount. So that is statement number i. The other statement is you can choose it in such a way that in fact uh, these uh, variations commute. So that this indeed uh, defines a flat connection on the vector space of conformal blocks. That is sort of the key statement that can only be locally done in the moduli space of bundles. So all this uh, presupposes, well, Basically, I mean, it can be done in families, but uh, it cannot necessarily be extended globally over the choice of uh, this bundle E that uh, defines everything here. But in any case, well, um, here is in some sense uh, uh, the first, I mean, a key step is reached because we understand basically from this equation here why conformal blocks define D modules. D modules can in particular be flat connections. What we have defined here is a flat connection um, on the modular of bundles um, um, uh, through this equation. And uh, this is a particular case of a D module, right? So this is in some sense a key insight because uh, uh, in order, I mean, the goal after all of the construction is to produce um, D modules on the right hand side of the geometric long lens correspondence. And the way to do it is basically to produce the D modules by uh, 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 defining suitable conformal blocks. And uh, that's that's sort of uh, part of the strategy that Bailey and Andrean felt follow. So conformal blocks, if you wish, give a machine for producing D modules thanks to the existence of a um, flat connection on spaces of uh, um, conformal blocks. The experts will want to hear uh, instead of flat connections, projectively flat connection, which in some sense indeed is more accurate. But on the other hand, it can be shown uh, by making suitable choices. Um, you can locally trivialize the projectiveness that is um, the central element uh, that might in general appear here in the place of zero um, if you are, uh, um, well, if you are writing these things in a bit more generality. So locally, indeed, you can achieve flatness, uh, but uh, this will come back on you when you think about uh, global aspects that is global, that means global aspects on Bungie the extension of all this story globally over Bungie involves some uh, interesting subtleties uh, having to do with the fact that in general you uh, can only get projective flatness rather than flatness. All right. Good. Now comes uh, one more key ingredient that we will need, which is called the Sugawara construction. Um, that comes from a construction which basically builds the Virasoro algebra um, inside of the universal enveloping algebra of the fine Lie algebra that we work with. So it is basically a very simple construction, which is briefly reminded here. Um, well, I assume this to be mostly known or you can look it up quite easily. Uh, with a quick internet uh, search. So the point is simply to build bilinear combinations of these uh, generators of the D of the affine Lie algebra that we had denoted J and A. Um, a quick way to summarize this construction is here by this uh, normal ordering notation. And what this defines is a, well, 
infinite set of um, um, elements of the universal enveloping algebra denoted Sn that satisfy uh, these two commutation relations, which are not yet the commutation relations of the uh, Verisoro algebra, but very close to it, uh, because, uh, well, for some reason, which has to do with um, what we want to do in the future, we've split off here some explicit k plus h check factor, which um, just depends on the level, and h check is the dual Coxeter number, so something that only knows about the Lie algebra g that we're working with. And here comes what you might be familiar with from the definition of the Verisoro algebra, namely n minus n minus m times uh, well s with the mode shifted like this, and something that uh, uh, um, well some explicit thing that depends on the dimension of the D algebra in the place of the central extension of our uh, um, to be defined Verisoro algebra. Namely what uh, this implies is that you get the Verisoro algebra proper by a change of the normalization um, from the generators Sn. All right, so that is in a sense, I mean, okay, usually we, you would have just written this one over k plus h check uh, uh, in front of this normal ordered uh, expression in order to get um, immediately the generators ln of the Verisoro algebra. Now with some hindsight, we have um, postponed uh, uh, this uh, change of normalization. Uh, because we will uh, use the generators Sn a little later when we go to a special value for k, which is exactly making this here to zero. That is the critical level, and that is really uh, the place or that, that particular level that uh, Berlin and Rinfeld uh, work with in order to discuss uh, the uh, geometric Langlands correspondence. Anyway, after doing these definitions, we have a Verisoro algebra uh, defined inside of the universal enveloping of the affine algebra G hat K, which for us mostly is uh, SL2 hat K. Good, there is a close counterpart of the description of the tangent space to the moduli of bundles that is well known in um, Riemann surface theory, which is called the Verisoro uniformization theorem. Let me explain briefly how this looks like. So what it relates is T of C, which is the tandem space to the moduli of um, complex structures on the Riemann surface. So that is the 3G minus three dimensional space of uh, complex structure deformations of our underlying Riemann surface that is represented here as a double quotient. And uh, the game is very similar as what we have done in the case of bundles um, a few minutes ago. Namely, you take vector fields which are holomorphic on some annulus that you get by removing a point from some coordinate neighborhood uh, U. So that gives some annular region sitting inside of your Riemann surface. You can take the holomorphic vector fields on that annular region as representatives of, um, um, of uh, the complex structure deformations of the um, compact Riemann surface when you throw out whatever um, extends holomorphically um, down to the point P and when you throw out whatever extends holomorphically away from the point P all over um, the Riemann surface. So in this way, you can get representatives for complex structure deformations in terms of vector fields on this, uh, this uh, annulus that you get uh, uh, from a coordinate neighborhood by removing um, a chosen point P. And what it also defines for you is a map from the vector fields here to complex structure deformations. Um, so basically, well, uh, the, the quotient projection um, that is associated to this uh, double quotient description of the tangent space to the moduli of complex structures. Well, um, <clears throat> well, so then it allows you to do something 
which looks formally very similar to what we just did here, except that now what we're talking about here on the right are variations of the complex structure of the underlying uh, Riemann surface. And what we insert here is, um, ooh, I should have written the definition on the slide. Unfortunately, I forgot to do that. That is something which is very similar here. So it is just what I get by, I mean, so let me say it in words. So I'm taking here an element of um, this uh, space of um, meromorphic vector fields. I'm doing a Laurent expansion. I'm replacing then the modes of that Laurent expansion uh, by the uh, generators of the Verasoro algebra. And with those, I can act on the vector V. So this defines an action of the Verasoro algebra on my representation that we had associated to the point P. And this is what I'm using here in order to represent the um, infinitesimal variation in a direction uh, um, uh, psi um, of a complex structure of C. And what that defines uh, in a similar way as before is a projectively flat connection on the space of bundles, but now on the, uh, 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 it's a connection in the, uh, which describes the variations of the complex st uh, structure C rather than the variations of the bundle, uh, of the holomorphic bundle E. So in the, um, in the conformal field theory, which is called Westman Witten conformal field theory, these both elements play a crucial role. So we have, I mean, just what you should keep in mind, maybe all this is a little quick, but uh, in the end of the day, we're talking here about objects which have functional dependence, both on moduli of the Riemann surface C and moduli of the bundle E. So in the end of the day, they're gonna define for us functions, which are functions on the moduli of bundles as well as on the moduli of uh, Riemann surfaces. And we have rules uh, or differential equations uh, describing the variation with respect to these two dependencies. And well, the differential equations doing this, these are the famous KZB for Knishnik Zomolochikov Bernard equations. So the abstract form is basically uh, equivalent to what we've just done here. Namely, we can now um, use, so T here was a bilinear expression in terms of virus of of the current algebra or affine Lie algebra generators. These in turn, I can represent in terms of variations in the direction of bundles. So what this yields is here a relationship of the form, a variation of the complex structure can be represented as a second order differential operator because we're applying basically this rule here twice. Um, a second order differential operator with respect to uh, um, the choice of a bundle. So that is a um, abstract form. And then, well, just working everything out and making it more explicit, you can pick local coordinates on the modular space of, um, of, um, of uh, Riemann surfaces and uh, local coordinates on the modular space of holomorphic bundles. And what you end up with uh, from these uh, somewhat abstract uh, considerations is um, a differential equation which takes the following form. We have a partial derivative with respect to some of these coordinates of the modular of bundles being represented as a uh, by the action of a second order differential operator on what we will interpret as a wave function of a sort uh, here, which is a function, yeah, uh, here considered, I mean, here this K only contains basically derivatives with respect to these variables X, whereas uh, derivatives with respect to the variables Q are exclusively here on the left-hand side of this equation. And we can arrange the definitions in such a way that these operators commute, uh, reflecting uh, the possibility to have flatness, uh, at least locally, of these uh, parallel transport on the spaces of conformal blocks. Um, 
Well, the arguments have been somewhat abstract in order to somehow bridge between the point of view of mathematics, which is used, of course, in the constructions uh, heavily of uh, Bailin and Greenfeld, and the language of the physicists. So, I mean, in the physics literature, you often find then explicit ways to uh, write down such equations uh, of, of this form in some explicit coordinates. The point, and maybe this you can take as a uh, intermediate summary and upshot of the previous discussions, uh, we are thereby basically um, getting a, well, in good cases, um, a one-to-one -one correspondence between spaces of the affine algebra conformal blocks and the spaces of solutions to the KZB equations, which you are invited to think of uh, in this uh, concrete form that we have written down here, where if you well, really work hard, you can even uh, deduce an uh, uh, explicit formula for these, but they may of course become complicated in general. <clears throat> well, let me note that of course, uh, there are a couple of interesting questions uh, uh, associated to this. So, well, the story is relatively nice and simple in the case of compact uh, westman witten models. In more general cases, uh, there are a lot of, uh, well, probably in largest generally um, um, unsolved questions. So um, you may consider, uh, so the spaces of conformal blocks uh, may in some cases become infinite dimensional. Then there are obvious questions about sort of the spaces of solutions, yet these equations of course still make sense. And furthermore, uh, it, uh, these um, um, second order differential operators, which we find here on the left hand side, uh, they turn out to have certain, uh, they turn out to have interesting singularities for some bundles, which are here just uh, labeled by the coordinates X. Uh, so for example, there are uh, these type of singularities which become relevant, um, they are related to, uh, these uh, wobbly bundles that uh, in this uh, school there are whole series of lectures about by uh, Anna Pionieto. So this is where these uh, things can have singularities and they play uh, ultimately a very interesting role in the story. I notice that I'm running out of time. I am formally over time already. So um, if you want, uh, I can just uh, stop here for now, continue next time. In any case, I should uh, take a breath and take questions up to this point uh, uh, and, uh, well, uh, ask the chairman for advice, uh, yeah, whether I just stop and take questions or whether I should uh, continue a little bit. Um, that is uh, what I want to leave to you now. So I'm asking for questions as well as uh, advice uh, from the uh, so, okay. chairman. I think Satoshi is not, uh, yeah, I think we are not able to hear him. So maybe, uh, so Yark, is it a short five minute extension or how much uh, longer? Yeah, uh, I mean, okay, I, I, I have to admit that, um, good. Okay, I can tell you sort of how the story would continue. I think it makes a lot of sense maybe to continue with all this next time, uh, which means that, uh, well, my, I, I was, I have to somehow redesign probably the third lecture because uh, I was expecting to be a little faster, but in any case, uh, yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense maybe to stop for now and then continue with this uh, next time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jörg, for that wonderful talk. So let's first thank uh, the speaker. And uh, so, yeah, if you have any questions, you can either post it into the chat box or you can also go ahead and uh, raise your hand. Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing any hands so far. There, there were a few questions on chat, but maybe it was Jorg already addressed one those. question. I addressed some of them. Uh, there was one which I didn't quite understand. So here I would uh, like to ask uh, the one who, so it is about some kind of fusion algebra or hypergroup structure. Uh, 
yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't really quite, get I couldn't quite get the question. So if uh, the person who asked it uh, wants to explain a little more what was uh, meant by that, uh, I could try to. Yeah, okay, I'll check with them. But I think in the meanwhile, Pranav has a question. Pranav, go ahead. Hi, Jörg. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Hi. Uh, hi. Thanks. So uh, my question is about, uh, you know, at the beginning you talked about OPERS uh, and there is uh, there is a stratification of the moduli space of local systems with the lowest stratum being the OPERS, right? Uh, which... That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you describe generalizing, by like going from the OPER case to the gender case, uh, you mentioned one approach, something uh, to do with uh, allowing poles, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, is this related to the stratification, the open stratification? Yeah, it absolutely mm -hmm. is. Uh, namely, um, basically, well, a way to formulate it is using the Riemann Hilbert correspondence. Um, of course, yeah, you have to formulate two things. So, on the one hand, which precise uh, strati upper stratification you refer to. But, uh, well, there is at least one stratification that you simply can define with help of the Riemann Hilbert correspondence, namely, uh, you can observe that um, um, the so there is a monodromy map from uh, local systems or oppers uh, to the character variety, and um, this well uh, was, uh, the partially defined inverse is called the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence. The statement is that um, basically you can use it to stratify. The space of local systems, or in other words, uh, you can um, you can stratify the well. Perhaps a better way of saying it is you can spread stratify the space of local systems by the minimal number of apparent singularities that an opera must have in order to be. Um, gauge equivalent to uh, the local system in question, right? So this defines a stratification, which uh, I think must be basically the same as what you refer to as opera stratification. And uh, yes, so uh, the oppers in the sense of uh, the, the purely holomorphic oppers would define the lowest stratum because they, well, they don't have any apparent singularities, uh, but then, um, it has the stratification by the number of apparent singularities. And then there is a top stratum, which has the same dimension as the, um, the uh, moduli of uh, local systems. And does this have a physical interpretation of being in a particular stratum? Um, I guess this is a bit of a vague open. Well, physical, yeah, now, now you what should say which physics you have in mind because uh, the whole story has multiple uh, interpretations. interpretations. Yeah. So of course, uh, well, Edward is talking about one, uh, conformal field theory is another. Yeah. Um, I can say for conformal field theory, it's quick and easy to, um, um, in conformal field theory, it's relatively easy to say what the change would be. So, um, so basically, here what we're about to define is a relation between oppers and conformal blocks um, of a special kind, and um, these um, um, apparent singularities would uh, correspond to would correspond to um, um, to extra degenerate fields inserted into the conformal blocks. Uh, in Edwards' context, uh, it will correspond to, I believe, but okay, that will require probably a little more of thought and discussion. It will correspond to certain line operators uh, uh, in the context of the N equals four uh, super young Mills theory. But while really explaining this uh, or making it precise, uh, well, would take a little bit of time. But yes, it does have a physical interpretation, which I hinted at, at least, very roughly. Thank you, that's, that's very interesting. Um, so uh, any other questions? I uh, couldn't fully understand what was posted in the chat, so I requested the participant to maybe post it later on Slack. Uh, 
Uh, a now. product formula for eigenfunctions of differential operators give rise to a structure, presumably of Sturm level hypergroups. Okay, yeah. I may fail to answer this question at least uh, quickly. Uh, so I'm now look also looking at the chat because it refers to some uh, pieces or branches of mathematics uh, that I'm not very familiar with. Uh, so these Chibli trimetia hypergroups or polynomial hypergroups, I cannot immediately relate to uh, what is um, what is uh, uh, happening here. So I may simply fail to give a, a answer to this question, I must admit. I think uh, that's, that's, that's fair. Uh, so let's see, uh, I don't see any other hands up. So I had a quick question, York. So if you're studying non-compact WZW models, uh, how does the difference between SL2R and SL2C come about in the sort of algebraic language that you uh, reviewed like uh, yeah of course now you're uh, stimulating me to try a um, try a sort of uh, a view into the future um, there is a good hope that uh, this has a generalization to non compact groups my plan is if I managed sort of to accommodate it with a timing now being slower than I thought uh, to in the third lecture to turn to a non-compact with Minuten model, which is uh, the one um, um, for the hyperbolic three space also denoted H3 plus West Minuten model, which is uh, the best understood non-compact West Minuten model we have on the market for which there is a rigorous mathematical basis uh, ultimately. I want to say at least a little bit about this in the third lecture. Um, for that case, there are basically the same equations, uh, KZB equations, uh, the main point being that we will be looking on other sets of solutions in that case. So um, the KZB equations look formally the same, except that we may consider then continuous uh, uh, values for this level K. And we will be considering spaces of solutions, which in particular, um, well, will be characterized by a different type of singular behavior near wobbly loci. So this sort of is the advertisement of some of the key interesting features that will appear in the non-compact context. But I should also say uh, very honestly and quickly that, um, well, there are a few things I believe I can say about this non-compact case, but uh, Really, this is, I think, something one should call a very interesting uh, subject for the future. So as I said, my hope is to be able to say a few things that I believe are reasonably sound in the third lecture, but I may, well, I may fail to do so properly due to reasons of time. So I believe there is gonna be a story uh, for the non-compact cases, but uh, it is largely to be developed. Um, so in particular, for example, cases like SL2R um, um, rather than SL2C are largely mysterious to me. Uh, I mean, almost completely mysterious to me. And uh, if I may add, uh, so if, if I recall correctly, even in the original work of Bellinson and Trinfeld, uh, irreducible local system sort of played a special role, right? Do, do you think uh, we understand what that condition means on the CFT side? Oh, you mean irreducible local systems? Yeah, irreducible. Uh, okay, yeah, this uh, drags the discussion into another direction. Um, well, not completely unrelated to the previous one, of course, but uh, good. Being representable in terms of operas uh, essentially uh, puts you, I mean, well, singles out the, the subset of the irreducible local systems. 
that is not all. And an interesting part of uh, generalizations, in particular of uh, what Rinkin and Gatesbury uh, envision for geometric Langlands, has to do with, I mean, includes certain reducible local system. Um, and again, for their role in conformal field theory, I must say, I don't know. Uh, I would have, I would hope or would have hoped that maybe somebody else uh, in among say speakers or audience here uh, has some comments to make, but uh, this indeed is another interesting direction uh, for the future. So, well, in some sense also reflecting sort of the state of affairs, you can in the generality sort of of the program uh, of uh, Rinkin and Gatesbury, uh, it may not be so clear what the CFT interpretation is, but on the other hand, for the cases uh, uh, that uh, Baylin and Greenfeld have been looking at related to oppers, one can go somewhat farther into the CFT direction, um, maybe now than, uh, well, a couple of years uh, ago. Thank you. Uh, so, uh... Yeah, I might I, stop share because yeah. Can... Yeah, I don't think I see any other questions in the chat or hands raised. Uh, so yeah, if there are no further questions, let's thank Jörg again.